This is the episode seven of Stock Market 101, and today I want to introduce you to indexes, ETFs, and mutual funds. Check it out. What's up guys, this is Nairman Z again, and today I wanna to introduce you to some of the most popular instruments in financial industry. So there are roughly 4,000 individual companies out there only in the US and so many more throughout the world. So it's very hard to get a grasp of the entire market, evaluate it, or look at a specific sector and see how well it is doing. Instead, financial experts created something that they can visualize and evaluate a large number of stocks altogether. So indexes, or indices if you want to be grammatically correct, are financial instruments that indicate a group or portfolio of stocks and securities in aggregate. The three most famous indices are Dow Jones, NASDAQ, and S&P 500. Dow Jones Industrial Average takes 30 large U.S. companies and takes an average of their stock prices. Among these holdings, you can see top companies from almost every industry, such as 3M, Apple, Coca-Cola, Nike, Procter & Gamble, Chevron, J.P. Morgan Chase, and McDonald's. The NASDAQ Composite takes a weighted average of more than 3,300 companies listed on NASDAQ Stock Exchange, and S&P 500 takes the average of largest 500 companies in the United States. All these three indices give you a really good idea of how market is doing overall, especially the S&P 500. Hence, a lot of times they're referred to as the market. So for example, if a stock grows 33% throughout the year, and S&P 500 index only grows 25%, the stockholders claim that the company performed 8% better than the market. Or in short, a lot of times they say the company was able to beat the market. Beating the market means that your investment did better than average companies out there in the market. And it also is a sign of a really strong portfolio. There are also industry specific indices that allow the investors to track specific industries, markets, or type of security. So for example, we have indices for real estate prices in specific region, gold, silver, crude oil, technology stocks, or even cryptocurrencies. And these indices allow investors to track industry-specific or country-specific market data historically and compare them to each other. And that gives them really valuable insight to whether they should switch industry to industry or even invest in stocks outside United States. So indexes are great, but their biggest problem is that you cannot invest in them because they're not stocks in the first place. They're just an indicator. But since they're very popular, large banks and financial institutions have created bundle of stocks and packaged them into exchange traded funds. These exchange traded funds, also known as ETFs, can easily be bought or sold just like any other stock. These ETFs are one of the most common securities traded among investors, and they're very popular in the portfolios of 401k retirement plans. If you want your money to grow like the Dow Jones Index, Instead, you can invest in SPDR Dow Industrial Fund, also known as DIA. If you want to track NASDAQ index, you can instead invest in Fidelity NASDAQ Composite ETF, also known as ONEC. And if you want to invest in S&P 500, instead you can invest in SPDR S&P 500 ETF, also known as SPY. There are also ETFs for all types of securities and commodities, such as real estate, gold, silver, crude oil, and anything you can think of. My personal favorite ETF is called QQQ, which is composed of top NASDAQ technology stocks such as Amazon, Apple, Google, Microsoft, and Facebook. Investing in ETFs is personally my favorite type of investing for three reasons. A, it is super diversified. It usually involves investing in more than hundreds of businesses. So even if one of those businesses completely fails, you only lose 1% of your share value. B, it doesn't require that much thinking. You can just 
let your money sit there without the need to hire a fund manager and you can be sure that your money will grow as much as the entire stock market grows. And finally, if some of those stocks in the ETF happen to pay dividends, you also receive some of those dividends based on how much you've invested in the ETF. Even better. So that was it about ETFs. Now let's go over the final concept called mutual funds. So if you have a significant amount of money that you would like to invest, but you're not confident enough to invest it yourself, you can put it in a mutual fund, which is basically a portfolio of stocks and different types of securities actively managed by a fund manager. These type of funds usually charge you a management fee at the end of the year, either based on a percentage of your total portfolio value or as a percentage of your gains. Just like the ETFs, the mutual funds also comes in different varieties and shapes. There are mutual funds that are heavy on equity, also known as the stocks, for more risk-taking investors. And there are mutual funds that are more bond-heavy, more suitable for conservative investors. Some mutual funds also throw out commodities in the mix, such as real estate and gold, to balance the portfolio and hedge against the market risks. You can find these mutual funds through big banks like Citi, Wells Fargo, Bank of America, and JP Morgan, or you can find them through asset management firms that are solely designed for managing money for investors. Some of the notable asset management firms are BlackRock, Vanguard, Charles Schwab, and Fidelity. One of the biggest criticism to mutual funds is that they do not produce much more profit than the average market index. In a study done by Standard & Poor, roughly 1 out of 20 fund managers beat the S&P index, meaning that 19 out of 20 actually perform as good as S&P or do worse. This happens mostly due to human error and the algorithms that these fund managers use for investing, and they keep going in and out of stocks throughout the year. But in majority of cases, these algorithms happen to be detrimental to the portfolio. That means, and most of the times, they would have been better off just keeping their money in regular ETFs and not done anything about it. And for you as an investor, this means that unless you're really lucky and you can find that one winning mutual fund, you are just better off putting your money in ETFs or index funds. The second criticism to these mutual funds is that their management fee slowly but surely eats up your investment throughout the time. These fees generally are between 0.5% to 2.5%, depending on how well known and how significant that mutual fund is in the world of finance. And you might say that little fee is nothing compared to the 10 to 15% average annual return that these mutual funds give you. But you have to wait and see the effects in long term. For the sake of simplicity, let's assume that the average return is 10% a year and the management fee is only 1%. That means at the end of the year, you should be getting around 9% on your total portfolio. So in 10 years, if you make a 9% ROI annually, your investment will grow by 137%. And I've shown the math just in case you're wondering how we got to that number. On the contrary, if you simply put your money in ETF and receive the 10% annual return without paying the management fee, you would be making 10% a year for 10 years, which would leave you with 159% in return. Why is there such a large difference? Well, it comes down to a concept called compounding effect. If you don't pay the management fee, you can keep that 1% and reinvest it like the rest of your portfolio, which gives you an additional 10% on that small portion. In the second year, you save another 1% and invest it like rest of your portfolio, so you get an extra 10% on that portion and the portion you saved last year. These small amounts keep growing every year with a fixed percentage and they compound to a larger amount over time that is significantly larger than the original amount. For the example I made earlier, if your account size was $10,000 initially, your investment would have grown to $25,937. Versus if you kept paying that 1% fee every year, you would have only grown it to $23,673. That means you would have saved an additional $2,263 if you kept your money in ETF and didn't waste it on mutual fund fees. Now imagine how much faster you can grow your wealth if you start with more money initially and you're willing to keep it for a much longer time such as your retirement account. The same portfolio that I told you about with 10% return every year, 
after 40 years, it can give you a whopping return of 4,426%. But if you kept paying that 1% fee every year, you would have reduced your return to, wait for it, 3,041%. So as it appears, your best bet for long-term as well as short term in many cases is just to put your money in index funds such as S&P 500, Dow Jones Industrial and Nasdaq. That way you don't have to worry about managing it or touching it for a very long time. Day trading or short term trading is very speculative and requires a lot of knowledge and skills. And a lot of times still experienced investors lose money. That's why I say as a beginner or even an experienced investor, it's better to put the large portion of your money in ETFs. And if you want to play around or experiment things, just set aside a small portion of your money and buy and sell stocks based on your own algorithms. That's it for today, guys. Let me know in the comments below what types of investments have worked for you and what are your favorite ETFs, mutual funds, or indexes. Also like and share the video if it made a difference for you and made you a better investor after all. In the next episode, I'm going to talk about commodities and cryptocurrencies. So if you don't want to miss out, make sure you hit that subscribe button and hit the notification bell so it reminds you whenever the new episode is out. Thank you for watching and as always, don't forget that money never sleeps. Peace.